Do you find modern men weak? <laughs> Absolutely. No, I don't think so. Yes, no. Yes, no. Why don't you think so? I just think it's part of evolving and we're just going through the years and I actually think if anything it's stronger <laughs> as the opposite of weak. So to be modern. Do you like What's that over there? Or not? Yeah. Half and half. I don't want them to like clean the toilet bowl every day. Do you want a little bit of independence but not yeah, too much? Because at the end of the day, historically, a woman cleans up after a man. No. I disagree with it massively, but I still do it. I wouldn't class them as weak. I just think that they're shy and maybe like hard to say what they actually feel because it's quite hard with like boys rather than girls. Mixed opinion. Well, I think a man who is strong and secure in himself doesn't need to be threatened by a powerful woman because he can hold his own in any situation. Why? They can never ask a girl on a date. It's always just like, oh, let's hang out or whatever, but they like can't ever say that they actually like you. So do you like a full... Who can't? <laughs> are modern men too weak that's a clip that you just saw from i don't know how to pronounce it comma tv k-a-m-a tv and the full video is about seven minutes long but the host that you saw there with the microphone she did an episode asking are modern men too weak and she basically went out and was asking a lot of different women their opinions on modern men i think Sometimes there's more to be learned by the mere asking of a question than from the attempts to answer it. And I think it's very interesting that this is a question that is even being asked because we're not looking at a conversation that men were having. We're looking at a woman going out to talk to other women about our modern men too weak. And it made me ask myself, hmm, is this a conversation that every generation has had? Is this something that women of every time period have asked? Are, are men today vulnerable enough or too vulnerable? And so it got me thinking about this topic of vulnerability. And I thought it would be interesting for you and I following up our last episode on relationships to talk about this idea of vulnerability, particularly as it relates to men. Because one of the things you'll notice in that clip is you had some women talking about men like they're being so vulnerable that they come off as weak. And some talking about men like, no, I like it when they can talk about their feelings. So you and I are going to be riffing today on our own ideas about male vulnerability. Is, is it something that we need more of? Is it something that we need less of? What does it even mean to be vulnerable? And are there pros and cons? So you ready for this conversation, brother Kamal? Yeah, I think I think just vulnerability as, as a broader topic is an important part of just personal development. I think it's to get to the best version of yourself. Um, you don't want to be detached with what reality is. You don't want to be detached with how you're feeling about things. You don't want to be detached, um, just broadly speaking, for, for however that applies in your life. And so I think vulnerability is it's one of those weird topics that I think a lot of people just immediately associate with like, oh, that's something that wussies talk about, like vulnerability. Um, but I, I think it actually takes a lot of strength to be vulnerable um, and, and, and it actually can command a lot of power. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm excited to talk about this one. Yeah, man. Well, let's dive right in. So I basically have three clips for us today. And we're going to we're going to hear from a number of different perspectives on this topic. Th this first one is um, Arika. I hope I'm pronouncing your name right. Arika Angelo. And she made a video and I'll make sure we post the links to all of these on the YouTube channel so you can go check out the full video because we're just showing you clips. And she talked about why women need men to embrace vulnerability and how she believes that a lot of guys have been conditioned to think of vulnerability as a bad thing. So we're going to take a look sure. at her clip and then we're going to come back and we're going to riff on our thoughts about her thoughts. One thing that I feel like men have not been given the permission to do and to be is a very important word, which is called vulnerable. When I work with a lot of men, I coach single men or I coach men who are struggling in their relationships. And I start talking to them about vulnerability. Well, have you said that to her? 
And typically guys' responses back to me will go, she doesn't want to hear that or she's going to think I'm a weak man if I tell her that. Like I can't tell her that. And really that's just not true. You see, the fact that you can show up and be vulnerable with your woman or with a woman that you're getting to know actually shows a tremendous amount of strength. See, society has told you as a man that vulnerability is a woman's game. And that if you do that, then you know, you're not a real man. And really that's just a complete lie. Why? Because as a woman, we want to be able to access that side of you. Here's the other thing. Not only do we want to access that side in you, as a woman, that's our innate gift. Our innate gift is to nurture you, to love you, to heal you. So when you show up and you don't give a woman your vulnerability, you're basically saying, I'm not giving you access to me as a man, which essentially tells a woman, I don't need you. What? That's not what a woman wants to hear. A woman wants to be able to be there for a man. I want to share a story about something that I had uh, an encounter with, an experience with, um, being in a relationship with a man who was very capable, was the kind of, he's the kind of guy that can just make things happen. And one day things were going really catastrophic for him in his world. And he looked at me and said, I can't do it. It's, it's too much. It's too much. And in that moment, he just broke down and started crying. And my innate response as a woman was to wrap my arms around him, to hold him and to pour my love into him. Now he had a role in this. He had to use his strength to go against societal norms and to show himself to me. And the other thing was he had to take a risk that I would receive him well. And I will say there was a third. He had to be able to receive the love that I was giving him. You see, if you go through your life, men, not being vulnerable and putting up shields and putting up walls, you are missing the opportunity to capture, to feel, to receive the essence of what a woman truly is. Her nurturing side, her giving side, her caring side. All of those things that bring healing and bring joy to a man. <laughs> it's always nice to just start it off with a good laugh. <laughs> what do you think, bro? Uh, you know what? I actually would like to hear you go first, and, and here is why. Um, I think whenever you're talking about relationships, I think everybody does it differently. I uh, definitely do not even pretend to be a relationship guru, coach, expert. Um, I am currently alone and single. Um, and, and largely, I think, by choice. But I think I would prefer to hear somebody who is married. You know, somebody who who really understands uh, what that entire process entails and and how has it applied for you and and and, and what has that even transpired as? Um, but I'm I'm happy to comment on it. But I, I would like you to set the stage. I'd, I'd love to hear what it is from your perspective. Yeah, man. Let me just first say though, I don't I don't really present myself as a relationship expert either. But I, but I also reject the cult of expertise. I prefer to evaluate all ideas based on the arguments that are presented on behalf of those ideas. So if you're not an expert, you don't have the credentials, but you give me a good argument, I give you your day in court. And if your argument is compelling, I go with your idea, even if you ain't got a degree behind it. On the other hand, if you got seven PhDs, but you give me a bad argument, I don't care about your expertise. I reject your irrational, unsupported opinions. So Word just, for those who are, just for those who are listening, don't ever listen to anything I say because it comes from TK or any letters I may try to put behind my name. Evaluate what I have to say based on the arguments I set forth on behalf of it or based on your ability to experiment with the ideas themselves, weigh them against your own experience to see if it works for you. That should be the only basis for you know, your relationship with ideas, in my opinion. With that having been said, I'm, I'm doing like Stephen A. Smith now. I got the long 
preambles. <laughs> With that being said, let me go ahead and give you the final word. <laughs> What's the final word? I'm gonna tell you what jumped out at me, bro. I'm gonna tell you what I jumped out at what jumped out at me because I I was getting ready to just pretty much co-sign and say all yep. the ecumenical things about vulnerability. Yep. But I'm actually gonna lead with what might be more of a counterpoint. Pay close attention to that story she told at the end about that guy who was vulnerable and how much it meant to her. And zoom in on the words that she used to describe that guy the moment she began to talk about him. And I think you'll learn a whole lot about this subject. Notice that she described him as a guy who had the ability to make things happen. A guy who was powerful. She described a guy who had competence and conviction. And within, the, within that context, she then began to talk about how much it meant to her when his life was falling apart that he was able to be vulnerable with her about it. What mm -hmm. that tells me is her attraction to him was not based on mere vulnerability divorced from context. Her attraction to him was based on the fact that he was a man that demonstrated competence and conviction. And it was vulnerability within that context that was appreciated. Here's why that's so important to me. There are a lot of things that people say about vulnerability that can lead guys to think that leading with vulnerability is some kind of dating strategy that's going to make people like you. That you should just walk up to women since they say they need vulnerability and you just start you should you just just start crying about your problems, you should dump your problems on them. And I'm going to say I have never and I don't think I will ever meet a single woman that is attracted to a man who is vulnerable in the absence of demonstrating any competence or conviction whatsoever. As a man, you have to be an independent thinker. You have to have some opinions of your own. You need to be a high value person and you need to be focused on being, being a high value person in a way that transcends just thinking about material possessions, of course. You need to be someone of conviction. You need to be someone that's devoted to developing your competencies. And I think sometimes, when people hear this idea that men should be vulnerable, they create problems for themselves by leading with vulnerability because they think someone is going to like them more if they're just vulnerable. And so they, they initiate a conversation by talking about their weaknesses, talking about their problems. And there is such a thing as being vulnerable without context that drives people away and that that crosses boundaries or that is perceived as disrespectful or that can actually make you look <clears throat> incompetent. And so what I would say is focus more on simply being truthful because there are moments mm -hmm. in life where you really will be strong. And there, there are moments in life where you really will be struggling. And the goal is to be non-pretentious about your situation. If you're strong, don't be pretentious about it and try to pretend like you're weak for the sake of getting someone to like you. And if you're struggling, be honest enough to set the boundaries or request the things that you need so that you can effectively deal with whatever the problem is. But don't use vulnerability as a strategy to make friends or get women to like you. Be a man of value, be a man of competence and conviction and let your vulnerability be the natural, organic, uncoerced, non-simping expression of what it is you need to deal with the problems in your life. I think if you're somebody who likes other people, somebody who, who's a people person and, and likes to, to, to make a lot of friends, um, who likes to have a lot of connections, who likes to do a lot of things for people, to be of service for people, it is really tempting um, to exercise vulnerability by your way of connection. That this is the thing I'm gonna use to get an in with you, uh, that this is the thing that I'm going to um, show you so that you can give me what I want, which is your friendship, your companionship, um, again, a connection. And yeah. 
what the, I think the problem that happens is if you lead with that and you don't lead with the truth, then you set the precedent for yourself that you are this kind of person. And then when you do try to turn around and live in accordance with your truth, which might actually, which, which might not actually be as vulnerable as you may have led somebody to believe. Um, I think mm -hmm. people often are taken aback by that. They're, they're, they're like, whoa, who is this tough guy? Who is this, um, you know, super hard guy? Who, who is this other person that you're now showing me um, that I'm not used to, that, that you led me to believe you are? And it's funny because like the flip can get, or the script can get flipped on you and it could be put like, oh, now you're just acting like a tough guy or now you're, you're fronting and it, and it, th that might not even be the case. The case might just have been that you weren't being truthful to begin with, uh, that you were, uh, you allowed yeah. yourself to fall into the temptation that I just need to be vulnerable to prove a point where I need to go super out my way um, to make this person, you know, feel more comfortable and accommodating. And I think when people are living in accordance with truth, with, with their personal um, freedom and, and, and their inner, um, you know, intentions, I don't think they need to do all that. I, I think they can find the balance that makes sense and that works for them. And that is the most truest expression. I think that's what people want at the end of the day. They want to know who the real you is. That doesn't necessarily mean they're going to like that up front, but I think most people will respect that. Most people will, will learn, um, will learn how to just work with that. And I think it's a learning process for you too, if you decide to live within your truth, because you get to know how people are responding to maybe certain truths that you have and, and you learn how, um, you know, how to present those and, and, and how to um, make those compromises with other people's truth. But if you come in and you're just being vulnerable for the sake of signaling something, then I think you're, you're, it might seem like the right thing at the time. It might feel good. It might be easy. You might be uh, more or better received that way, but you're doing yourself a disservice. You're doing the other person a disservice. And a lot of times it just ends up in confusion and frustration. And, you know, both parties, they, they, they diverge from the, the principle of vulnerableness to begin with. Neither one of them want to even go to that space anymore because it doesn't seem like it's true, that it's pure. It seems like it's false, and that's made up. And I think that's what you don't want to do. Yeah, absolutely. And I think vulnerability rightly understood is just another form of truthfulness. And in many ways, it's an expression of strength, right? Like, and people will respect it. If you if you own it and you and you convey it truthfully. So my my examples of this would be, let's say if you don't know the directions to get to some place, or you don't know the answer to some very important question, vulnerability is refusing to pretend like you know what you don't know and just being willing to ask. We talked about that with Kobe and MJ, right? How Kobe wanted to know what's that move that you did, and I'm going to ask you. That's a kind of vulnerability, but in the in the, in the same sense. It was admirable. People respected that this guy's desire to get better was so strong that he was willing to ask another man a question in order to get information that could help make his, his game better. Or if you are at a place where you're about to have a breakdown and you just can't say yes to the demands that people are making on your life, or you just need some time, or you need some professional help, vulnerability is refusing to pretend that those things aren't true and doing whatever you have to do to say no to the things that are going to drain you further and to say yes to moving in a direction that's going to get you the help that you need. I just want to emphasize that and we've already made this point. That vulnerability does have an unhealthy expression, just as trying to be strong and tough is. And mm. I think in the same way that we need to tell men hey, you have the permission to admit that you need help. You have the permission to admit that you don't know something. You have the permission to set boundaries and say no. We also need to say, don't, don't assume that just because you're being vulnerable that you're being honest because there is a certain form of fake vulnerability that can actually make relationships worse. 
when you pretend to be weak or when you talk about your weaknesses in a context that is not healthy or in a bad time or in a bad tone, those kinds of things can backfire. So everything in life requires the use of critical thinking in terms of how you apply it. Let me ask you a follow up question, though, because what it seems like the angle that she's coming at it from is that there aren't enough men who are vulnerable that um, through society and through maybe historical context that we've been conditioned to not be vulnerable. And so, you know, you're you're, I think, approaching it from the counterpoint. But I'm interested. Do you think that there are more uh, men and maybe people in general who aren't as vulnerable as they should be? Or do you think that there are more people um, who use vulnerability the wrong way and that they're authentic to cater to people um, within you know, our current day society? Sure. Well, when it came to her in particular, and then I'll, then I'll get to your question more directly, I think she was sincere in what she said, but that's also why I pointed out the way she chose to describe that guy when she said she appreciated his vulnerability. That wasn't the point of her video. And I don't, I don't see this as a contradiction, but I think it's very important to pay attention to things like that. Because sometimes our theories of why we're attracted to people might vary from the conscious descriptions we give uh, of those people's qualities. And I like to pay attention to both the words that people use when they describe what they're attracted to and their visceral response to people. And what I got out of what she said was she was attracted to that guy's vulnerability, but she felt the need to introduce him as a competent man who had the ability to make things happen. And I believe that that had as much to do with her attraction to his vulnerability as the vulnerability itself. But to answer your question, you know, because I see vulnerability in its healthy form as truthfulness about where one is and what one needs, I think asking if men are too vulnerable is not the best starting point because it implies that if the answer to that question is yes, then the solution is to try to figure out how we can help men be more vulnerable. And if it is the case that men are uncomfortable with the reality of their vulnerabilities, that's a symptom of a more fundamental problem, that men are not aligned with themselves, that men do not have a sense of purpose, that men do not have a sense of self-respect, that men do not understand their potential. And anytime you don't respect your potential and you are not aligned with yourself, you are not dealing with your own angst, with your own resistance, that's going to express in a number of unhealthy ways. And one of those unhealthy modes of expression might be feeling the need to be pretentious about areas of your life that are not working. I heard Dr. Miles Monroe say once, once that the root of man's frustrations is his misconception of self. When you don't mm -hmm. understand who you are, when you don't respect your potential and you don't have a sense of direction in life, that's going to express itself in all sorts of unhealthy ways. And what we call the refusal to acknowledge your vulnerability is just a symptom of that more fundamental problem. So I, I don't think it's so much about coaching guys on crying more for the sake of crying sure. more, but helping guys develop the level of self-respect and the level of passion for their purpose that they're willing to do whatever it takes to get the help that they need to get better. And that will involve overcoming pretentiousness. And does that answer I, just your to add on, it, it does answer my question. And I would just make an, an add on to say that I think the message is also encouraging people to be more authentic and, and to live within their truth. I think it, it, it's such a scary thing to, to be fully authentic and, and to, and to live, you know, in a hundred percent accordance with your truth, because at some point you are going to rub somebody the wrong way. It's inevitable. And I think a lot of times people don't want to approach that. They don't want to deal with the consequences or the perceived consequences of rubbing somebody the yeah. wrong way. And so they, they do things um, to cater to a particular situation, you know, whether they, you know, those are like societal norms or whether they're things that, um, 
you know, they may have uh, been taught to like mute themselves or, or layman like their inner um, in their natural kind of like habits and in the way that they approach things, they, they may have been taught at an age to, to, to tone that down. And I think the, the message really is, is to reverse that process is, is to get more in accordance with, with you and your truth, because that's the thing that will have the biggest impact um, on the world. That's going to the thing that's going to unlock your dreams. That's the thing that's really going to get you in alignment with that purpose is, is living in truth. And it, 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 I'm not saying that it's not scary. I'm not saying that it's, it's an easy process. And I'm not even saying that um, I'm not in that process myself. Um, but the closer that I've gotten to living in my truth, the more things really start to, to roll. And, and the more that you find other people who are living in their truth and that um, it, it's just so much easier to build upon and, and to create something uh, that wasn't already there. But to the extent that you're living for somebody else or that you're living in somebody else's truth, you're just perpetuating a person that's not really you. You're, you're perpetuating an idea that society or some other institution or some other group of people want you to be. You're not really being you. Yeah, I think what you just said points out one of the problems with cliche advice or, um, you know, I, I don't want to be unfair here, man. I don't want to be unfair because a lot of the things that we put out on social media, I do it too. You don't have time to give the full context. Okay. But this is why it's important to read long form content. This is why it's important to listen to things that are more than highlights and to read things that are longer than tweets because you need context in order to be able to apply insights effectively in your life. And there are a lot of cliches out there that will tell you to do something or that it's okay to do something. But if you don't think critically and creatively about how to apply those things in your life, you are going to create more trouble. So for instance, if I tell you something like, hey, you should talk about your problems. Okay, that seems to be good advice and it is, but it lacks context. You actually shouldn't just talk about your problems to anyone. Uh, at any time for any length of time. And you definitely should not talk about your problems exclusively. You should think critically about who you're talking about your problems to, how you express those problems to them, when you talk about those problems. And you also need to make sure you are spending some time talking about things other than your problems. If you neglect that context, then talking about your problems is only going to increase your problems. So yes, you should talk about your problems. That's the only way that you get help. At the same time, you should think critically about the who, the how, the when, and the what else when you talk about those things. That, to me, is an important part of this message on vulnerability. We're going to move to the next clip, man. Uh, this is a clip by, by two brothers, Abba, uh, Abba and Preach. Again, guys, y'all watching this, I hope I said y'all names right. <laughs> Kamal is actually my, uh, Kamal is actually, <laughs> Kamal actually saves me a lot of times by saying, bro, you cannot say the name like that. I remember I, I first said to him, uh, Giannis. I was like, man, I love Giannis. And he was like, hey, you can't, you can't be walking around talking like that, bro. That's not even his name. <laughs> so you saved me a lot, man. I mean, it probably comes from all the, um, the pain I've went through with my name. I mean, for those reading my name, y'all still can't pronounce it. And it's fine. It's going to be that way for the rest of the life. So, I, I yeah, that's funny. I got to give a shout out to my brother, William King Hollis. He was on here. He was like, what up, Camus? <laughs> that's the worst. That's that's when I'm just ready to, like, throw down and slap you in the face. Not going <laughs> to lie. but. <laughs> Oh man. Well, it's I believe it's Abba and Preach. And and these two guys were talking about discussions on vulnerability and this whole thing. Hey, men need to be more vulnerable. You need to embrace this. And they were saying, but sometimes that backfires. And so they talked to both men and women about what they think of this. Have you have you ever been vulnerable and had it backfire? And and women, what do you think about the guys who say that that's happened to them? So I divided it up into two clips because uh, both of them kind of have different themes. But let's go ahead and, and play this first clip and, and then we'll we'll wrap about it a little bit and then go into the second part. 
today's topic um, this is something i've wanted to cover for a long long time i think mostly because uh, for me it's been a point uh, that's almost made me angry when it comes to dating i think as a society we often tell young men and men in general that they need to be more emotionally vulnerable that they need to be comfortable with expressing themselves and what i've come to learn through my dating experiences is that when i've taken the time to be emotionally vulnerable with the women I've been seeing romantically, I've seen it backfire. I've seen times where I've shared what I'm feeling with women and I've seen them uh, get less attracted to me. And so I, I decided to interview some men to see if they had uh, a similar experience. Sure. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. I get it. Like, I'm not that type of person, but I get it. Well, I because <laughs> oftentimes we, we don't, think we are like this as women but we we have very old school ways of thinking about how men should be and, yes and but they, i just don't i don't want my that. man to be crying yeah. you know i mean i cry every 28 days of my yeah. cycle i don't want yeah. my man to be crying every 28 um, 20. uh with the right people yeah always worth it yeah. even if it ends in heartbreak the journey is worth it always yes yeah often often uh, we have this societal <laughs> pressure of being a man, so I need to toughen up, I need to show and command respect, um, and then willy-nilly, someone will decide, well, in this situation, you should have been softer, calmer, and better. And then the pendulum goes the other way, and then you've told, well, now you're too soft. So I, I constantly, I am myself, even currently, when I meet women, I'm not sure on which foot to, to dance right now. Yeah. Women are being taught to deal with a man's anger, a man's desire, a man's sexuality. We're being taught how to handle those situations, but we're never being taught how to handle a man being sad or a man being hurt or a man being disappointed. So we're used to like men like keeping it together. One of my favorite uh, philosophers says this, that what we often tend to do in relationships is that we use vulnerability at the wrong times. So I'm vulnerable at your expense versus I'm vulnerable to be informative. So an example of that is, um, hey, just so you know, when I get around bright lights, I start biting people. I'm informing you in a vulnerable sense. I'm informing you before anything has happened versus the light went on. I started biting you. Now you're hurt. And now I'm trying to explain to you why it is that I bite with bright lights. Okay. okay so yeah. that happens a lot where people have to then be emotionally available for somebody who has harmed them. Okay. You're expecting empathy from somebody whom is your attacker. This, this question is such an interesting one to me. And th this is, this is perhaps a, a, a more of a semantic issue, but it, but it, it strikes at the heart of what I consider to be a very important conceptual distinction. So I don't think men need to be more vulnerable. I think you already are vulnerable. There are so many things in life that are capable of crushing you, whether you like it or not to be vulnerable is an intrinsic part of the human condition. None of us are omnipotent beings. None of us are people who always occupy a space of holding all the cards and having all the leverage. We are all capable of being snuffed out by very powerful forces at any given time. And one day death will demonstrate our vulnerability because there will be nothing that we can do, no strength we can accumulate, no resources we can accumulate, that will rescue us from that ultimate and final expression of vulnerability. What we need to be, however, are people who understand that it's okay to have vulnerabilities. What we need to be are people who learn how to process those vulnerabilities in a healthy way. What we need to be are people who are not afraid to confront our vulnerabilities in order to figure out what we need to do in order to effectively cope with them or resolve them. That's what we need to be. And I have a major issue with approaching this topic in a way that causes people to evaluate themselves in terms of, are you crying enough? Are you talking about your problems with this person over here enough? We have to think about these things in terms of, I'm a human being, I've got limitations, I've got boundaries, I've got weaknesses, I've got frailties. What is the healthiest way for me as an individual to process those as an things? individual as a freaking individual? Say it again. Yes. 
as a freaking individual, right? Like, don't go through some little checklist that says, hey, uh, if you're around girls or if you're with your girlfriend, make sure you spend 10% uh, of your time admitting that you have weaknesses and problems. Like, no. What do you need to do as an individual in order to process those vulnerabilities in a way that is actually giving you what you need? And every conversation, by the way, isn't doing that. In fact, I would suggest that you don't even assume that just because there is a particular person that wants to see your vulnerabilities, that it's actually healthy for you to talk with them about it. I remember back in the day, I had a relationship and I was, I was heartbroken because we broke up. And I remember I was getting to a point where my healing was starting to happen. And I, and I was really starting to warm up to my new life. But every time I run into somebody, they'd be like, hey, so what happened with you and old girl? And then I start reliving it and I start telling it. And I was satisfying their curiosities, but I was actually bringing myself down and down and focusing on something that, you know, I didn't want to be talking about. And then one day it all changed, man. I ran into somebody and it was like, hey, what happened to your new girl? And I was like, oh, yeah, man, it's just over. Well, what happened? No, I'm done talking about that, man. That's in my past. I've told this story a hundred thousand times. My moving on is way more important than me satiating other people's curiosities. Oh, but you should be honest about it. I have been honest about it a hundred times. Yeah. I've literally gotten everything that I need out of that conversation. I do not exist in order to prove that I'm vulnerable. I do not exist in order to make sure that everyone who needs to see a man cry gets to have that example fulfilled from me. I exist for the sake of my own wholeness and I address my, my vulnerabilities only within a context that is actually helpful to me in a way that helps me get better and moves forward. It's not a friendship making strategy. It's not a dating strategy. It's a self-improvement strategy. And I mean, to add on to that, you, the thing that came to my mind is when you talk about athletes and athletes get up and they do these post game interviews and they do these um, pre game interviews and whatever other kind of interviews that they do. When people ask them questions and they say, I'm not talking about that or I'm done talking about that. And then, I mean, people just go bonkers. They get so upset. They're yeah. like, why? Why? Like, you owe me an explanation on <laughs> X, Y, Z. Um, and and you know, that's not the case. The case that is going to help them to continue to do their job, the case that's going to help you uh, be the best version, the case that um, that we're making here is for the individual, is for you to act in accordance with how you need to act, irregardless of a societal expectation or, you know, uh, a group of people trying to guilt trip you or trying to change you. I think that is the wrong question to ask. Like, do I need to dial um do i need to dial this up or dial this down if that's if you're asking that question because it's a headline that you read or you're asking that question because it was covered in some youtube video then i think you're asking the wrong question now if you're asking that question because you've had a serious relationship i mean a serious uh, conversation with your significant other and you guys are trying to work towards something more healthy of course like understand that that that's the source of that question is coming from a person that you have vested interest in trying uh to please and trying to maintain you know the harmony of that relationship but if you're trying to change and you're trying to accommodate other people's requests then you're further and further away from who you are as an individual what do you need as an individual that's what it's about it's about you as an individual don't be out here trying to do everything for everybody. Don't, you know, try to change yourself or, or try to adjust for this and that. That's not living in your truth. That isn't the thing that's going to make you the person that you're supposed to be. That isn't the thing that's going to help you change the world. You're living a lie. Live in the truth. There are people who will appreciate that truth. There are other people, there are other of us out here who are living in that truth. You can see it, you can feel it, it is authentic, and that is the thing that moves the needle forward. It, it, not just some other manufactured, I can't even say it enough, not some other manufactured version, um, but the thing that is really in line with your truth. Yeah, man, I, I think one of the things that scares people, perhaps even about the angle that we're approaching this conversation from is there's this sense of, yeah, but come on, haven't you at least heard one story 
about some guy that needed therapy and he never got it because he felt like as a man, he needs to be tough. I'm sure you've heard at least one story like that. And I would say, yes, I have heard that kind of story. And number one, I don't think the solution for that guy is to just go uncritically, unjudiciously talking about his problems with any and everyone, right? Just just going out into the public square and, and talking to anybody who listen isn't necessarily going to help him get better. So let's, let's acknowledge that as well. But I, I, I would say this is where I think if we're talking about this from the point of view of like men evolving and being healthy, I think this is why it's so important for um, men to seek out other men who can challenge them to get better because there, there is something around about being around other guys that, that Definitely. has th this, there's a way that men deal with men. That's just different, man. There's just a zone we go into <laughs> that's completely different. Right. And you need to be around other brothers who won't just push you in the sense of being like, come on, be a man, but will also push you in the sense of inspiring you to deal with your trauma and push you in yep. the sense of, inspiring you to learn and evolve. And, and I think a lot of times people who suppress what they're feeling and they choose not to get the help they need, a lot of times those people are actually unplugged from the kind of communities where they got other brothers they can talk to who can who can yeah. tell them like, hey man, you, you, you should go take that class over there. You should get some help yeah. over there. Or like, this is how you do it right here, man. Like don't run and don't hide, don't hide. Like in fact, there is nothing masculine about running from a problem, hiding from a problem, treating your problems as if they are some kind of God for you to bow down and worship and fear. What's masculine is that you align yourself with other people who can help you look at your problems as something that can contribute to your own evolution. You know, that's an interesting concept talking about kind of um, how men need other men. And I, I think the same could even be said for women um, I think there's a certain level of, like, I think men, when it comes to other men, we have a really accurate BS meter that we know when you're BSing. Um, whereas I think as a man, it might be easier for you to lie to a woman or to convince her, look, you don't understand, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I've heard, I've even heard, like I've asked women this, you know, um, and, I, and I've, I've just read that sometimes a guy will present themselves as X, Y, Z to a woman. And even though they might feel some type of way about it, um, they'll often just go along or they'll just go along. And, and you, you just hear these stories how uh, this woman was dating a man and then six months later, a year later, like this entirely different person erupts. And it's just like, whoa, like what, like this isn't who I thought you were going to be. And I think that's really hard to do um, man to man. Like I can't BS you for six months and be somebody that I'm not. Um, I think there's a certain level of, 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 of just authenticity that same sexes can have when, when, when trying to push each other to develop. Um, if I'm coming to you as uh, another man, as an equal, um, I also know what to look for in you as well. Like we, we we're here. Like I know what, I know what you're, I know the language that you're speaking. And I think that's so important. It's an important message because people um, who don't lean into that, I worry about them. I worry about people who are uncomfortable around other men or, or women who are uncomfortable around other women. Like th that, that, that shouldn't be a problem. Um, and maybe, you know, you guys don't have the same interest. That's fine. But, but broadly speaking, if you can't be around your same sex and, and you feel that you can't be around them because uh, it's too confrontational or, too much friction, then I think that's something that you need to look in, in internally and figure out. Because if if I'm amongst a group of men, it's a hundred and ten percent of fact that they're they are going to call my BS. They are going to call my bluff every single time, every single time. And I could I have the decision to either lean into that and to listen to that and to work on myself, or or to identify things that okay, this might be a shortcoming, but. 
I'm not going to work on that. I'm choosing to invest in something else. But the awareness piece is going to come from being around um, other men. And I, I think that's such an important point. People shouldn't be afraid of it. The people that are, I worry about them. I worry about them. Yeah, I, I think part of the part of the moral of that is don't don't hide behind vulnerability or don't use vulnerability as an excuse to hide from reality. Make vulnerability the companion on your journey of personal development. It's not a means. It, it's, it is a means to an end and the end being your own wholeness, your own self-actualization. That's that's the end. And vulnerability is a great companion in helping you move forward on that journey. But but it can also be a tool that we use to hide. And, and like you said, getting around people that can challenge you, call you on your BS too, that can help. Hey, let's play this last clip, man, because one of the brothers tells this interesting story um, about about a, a vulnerability pushback that he got. And I really want to hear your thoughts on this before we close. Less interested. No, no. I love someone who's like open and is sharing their life stories. Depends on what you're opening up about. If that's something like, say it's a, it could be also a sore spot for that person to deal with. I'll say it like, I'd come and open myself, but my feelings would be directed in another way. Like I'd feel like my feelings were used to, uh, strengthen another argument that for that reason mm. i don't open up about my shit because most people when they're not gonna have they're not gonna have any resources they're gonna use that against you i mean i had one girl i was briefly seeing and you guys remember this video potentially but i told her mm -hmm. that my father wasn't in my life any longer i didn't explain to her how but he just wasn't in my life and in, in a heated argument where she was screaming at me and I was being very quiet. At one point she said, this is why your father walked out on you because you're nothing in life. Not knowing that my father had passed away. And so she said that and she used my secret against me. And I was just like, oh, okay, cool. I understand what that is. You know what though? Like there's, there's, it's a double-edged sword because at the same time, if you want to have, uh, you know, really powerful relationships with people, they have to see you in sometimes the not most positive light. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree with his last point about it being a double-edged sword because I've been on I've been on that thing too where you know people show you your true colors or their true colors and uh, that that often can be challenging is 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 being vulnerable to the wrong people. Um, but I think you know this is something that I'll echo that you've already said before is is. You know, you don't need to be vulnerable to everybody. You don't need to walk out. The message here is not to walk out into city square and tell us the things that you should be writing in your diary. That is not the case for vulnerability. The case for vulnerability is uh, one to live in accordance, you know, with your truth um, to the best of your ability, whether uh, you are feeling emotional and sad or you're not. And if you're not, don't force yourself to go the other direction. Um, whatever whatever living in that truth looks like for you that that's where the power is uh i think the 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 second piece of it is choose the people that you're being vulnerable with wisely um i'm vulnerable with the people that i have an interest in developing strong relationships with i'm not vulnerable uh to just some business associate just because i'm trying to build rapport i don't I don't just give without without intention. Like I'm if I'm if I'm invested in this, it's I'm thinking it through. It's because um, I I'm really after um, this relationship, and I and I really want to invest in it truthfully. Like I'm not doing it as some you know manipulative or strategic you know avenue to to build a relationship, but it's because I want that level of truth within the relationship and vulnerability is one of the things, uh, it's like a prerequisite for that level of truth. So I think those are the two messages. Yes, vulnerability can be a double-edged double -edged sword, but if you're living in accordance with the truth, I don't think you should ever be ashamed of that anyway. I think it, it's a lot easier to not be ashamed when you are being truthful with yourself because you're just being you. And then again, you know, it, it's choosing the, the correct people. And I think, um, we could have a whole episode about that. So 
I won't necessarily go into that, but those are the two things that I think can help with that problem. I love that, man. Well, I, I, I'll, I'll try to match you and uh, I'll try to give two things. I think the first thing for me is I would say, make a distinction between being truthful and being transparent. You should always be truthful. That doesn't mean you always need to be transparent. What? What are you talking about, TK? Are you telling us to be dishonest? Absolutely not. But I think many people fall into the transparency equals truthfulness uh, trap and they create problems for themselves. To be transparent means to be wide open. You are just sharing anything and everything about yourself without the exercise of any discretion or privacy. And there are instances in which transparency can cause you a lot of harm. Just because there is a struggle in your life that is true, it doesn't mean you should just shout it out into the streets so everybody can hear. And so since we're in the age of F my life, go on Facebook every time you get fired from a job, every time somebody breaks up with you, every time you have a bad day, yeah, you're being transparent, but you're also putting yourself out there. And some people might be helpful. Some people might have your best interest in mind, but also don't be naive. It's a lot of people out there that do not have your best interest in mind, and they will use the information in your life against you. And not everybody deserves to be all up in your business. Be truthful about your challenges all the time, but be truthful in a context where you can get what you need and, and take seriously your right to privacy, your right to look some people in the eye and say, hey, it ain't none of your business what happened. I'm under no moral obligation at all to tell you all the private details of my life, but I am under an obligation to myself to be honest about what I'm going through and to make sure I'm talking to, to people about it who are relevant to me getting what it is I need. So don't fall into the I need to always be transparent trap. Fall into the I need to be truthful uh, category, whatever. Um, that won't make a good highlight, but you get what I'm saying. All right. So <laughs> the second thing I was <laughs> I'll be thinking about that all God. the time. I'll be thinking about that all the time. <laughs> Like, like if I would have nailed that last sentence, if I would have got that word, that would have been a great highlight, but I just blew it. <laughs> the second thing I'll say is um, whenever you are generous, whenever you are, because th this question of like um, being vulnerable and somebody taking advantage of you, it, it's kind of similar to being nice. How many people out there have, have been nice to someone else and then maybe they didn't respond in a way that made you feel like your kindness was appreciated and then you felt bitter and you felt resentful. I think one of the best ways to deal with that is to just make up your mind that when you're nice and you're generous, you're doing it for you. You're doing it because you value it. And ask mm. yourself, would I be proud of what I did even if the other person doesn't respond in the way that I thought? So let's say I'm at Starbucks and me and Kamau are about to connect. We about to meet up for work. And I think to myself, I should get him a cup of coffee. And then I get him a cup of coffee and I bring it. And Kamal says, oh, bro, I already had coffee this morning. I don't need this. Is that going to ruin my day? Is that going to be mad? Well, either I should just not buy the cup of coffee or when I buy the cup of coffee, I make up my mind that I'm going to be proud of myself regardless of how he reacts. I like the version of me that does this kind of thing. And I'm doing this because I want to live up to the version of TK Coleman that I think is a cool dude. And the version of me that gets him a cup of coffee, I probably would text you first to see if you had any. But the version of me that does the generous thing is the version of me that I'm actually proud of. And if you say, I don't want this cup of coffee, that's OK. I still get to win because I wasn't just doing it as a friendship making strategy. I was doing it as a way of living out my own ideals. That's not the best example because I know somebody going to tell me in the comments, but you could have texted him to see if he had the cup of coffee. I know. And that's what I would do in that situation. But just substitute something else and make the analogy work, make it work. But I think it's like that. I think it's like that with with vulnerability and kindness. You a lot of people out there, they feel like if I'm agreeable, then they're going to like yeah. me. if I laugh yep. at all their jokes and if I yep. say yes to everything that they want. Oh, if I if I help that girl move by giving up a whole Saturday to help her move all her stuff, she really going to like me. And then when they don't reciprocate whatever it was you thought you were going to get, now you're bitter. Nah, if you're going to help somebody move, if you're going to sit there and listen to somebody talk to you about a problem, 
if you're going to give a piece of yourself to someone, make sure that you have already decided that this is the person that you want to be and you're willing to own that decision, even if it doesn't go where you think it's going to go. Because we can't always control the results, but we can control the motives behind our actions. And it's very important that you find value in what you do based on the principles that you act from, not based on contingencies like how other people are going to react. I got some other stuff, but I, I want to cover it on Instagram Live. So, <laughs> all right, cool, man. Cool. Hey, we out, y'all. Check it out. If you enjoyed the show, click that like, hit that subscribe button. Let us know in the comments what you thought. And uh, if you have any questions, any other topics you want us to talk about, be sure to let us know in the comments. And don't forget to share with a family member or a friend that you think might enjoy the insights we shared in this conversation. All right, y'all, peace out. Keep on living the revolution because the revolution will be individualized. Peace.